Good evening. Welcome to Northern Life. Welcome if you're here in the room with us. And welcome if you're joining online. Would you like to stand as we start our service with some worship? covenant of faithful promises time and time again you have proven you'll do just what you say though the storms may come and the winds may blow I'll remain stand fast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness.
us, Father, as we gather here on another Sunday night to worship and glorify you. We do remember your faithfulness to us. We bring to mind all of your goodness in our lives, most notably that you gave your son for us to redeem us and to welcome us back into relationship with you. So we know you are present with us and we want to worship you tonight. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, sing, you're the God. You're the God who fights for me. Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. A cloud by day is a sign that you Fire by night is the guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my knees. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. And uh, if you're, well, I know there's people online because I've just been out there hosting. So um, hello to you too. It's good to be together um, worshipping. 
was such a big week last week and um, there's some highlights to show in a minute, but we're going to just have a look at a tiny bit of gold from Playgroup. So turn to the screen. As part of celebrating Easter at Northern Life, during Playgroup, we had hot cross buns for morning tea, an Easter story for the kids and families, and then we headed up to level two, there was an Easter egg hunt, which the children really enjoyed. The other thing that happened in the last month is we were doing our core value of known and loved. One morning, one of the playgroup kids came up to me showing me her bracelet that said loved. At their dance class, she'd been learning about I am strong, I am smart, I am brave, I am loved. And then I spoke to her and her mum about our known and loved core value, explaining what it means to be known by God and loved by God. They really liked this idea and said, we'll do another bracelet. So here we are. Here is the known and loved bracelets from one of our playgroup kids. What a joy it is to be celebrating Easter throughout the week, uh, as well as on Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and our core value that uh, spills over into our community, making sure that they know that they are known and loved too. Yes. How good is that? It's so lovely to just see those connections with community and church like that, just really powerful. Um, we had a wonderful day of, uh, if you were here in the morning, of baptisms. There were six baptisms in the morning. We had another one this morning, so that um, is like over 20 that we've had since the beginning of the year. So such a blessing. So we just saw it. Ben's put it together as a video. It's just like it's just worth watching again. So have another look at the screen. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour and I've been set free. I declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour. I declare Jesus my, my Lord and Saviour. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Saviour. Jesus is my Lord and Saviour. I want to start a new beginning. I'm here to testify today that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour. Amen. Alan, upon your confession of faith, it's my pleasure to baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. We often think that um, baptisms are so important for the person, but they're so important for us as a church and to stand together with all of the people. And there are, I know there are people in the audience here who are some of those 21, some of the six from last week. So it is important, I think, that we declare we're standing with you in prayer um, over your baptism and the life that Jesus is giving you. Uh, our core value, and it strikes me that you can see it in that video too, our core value this month is the canvas of colour or a canvas of colour and I'm not going to try and interpret it. Ben's going to do that on the screen. God is painting his story on a canvas of generations in the colours of the nations. This April we're looking at our core value canvas of colour. I think there's a good chance you right now are sitting in church watching this video. If so, look around. I bet you'll see people of different backgrounds, ages, experiences, languages, gifts, and personalities. At Northern Life, we are a canvas of lots of different colors, but we are a canvas, one long interconnected canvas of generations. Behind me is a literal canvas depicting the moment that the foundation stone of this church was laid on February 6, 1904. As a faith community, we have been meeting on this site for over 120 years. That's a lot of generations, and yet it's one long canvas, a canvas of faithful followers of Jesus passing on the wisdom of the gospel to the next generation and the next and the next right up to today. And so today, the question for us is, how tight are the canvas seams between the generations of our church? 
How well are we passing on the wisdom of the gospel back and forth between the many generations of our church? I had a lecturer at college who would often ask, who's your Paul and who's your Timothy? What he means is, who are you learning from and who are you feeding into? Because as followers of Jesus, we all need both. If we are going to have tight seams in the canvas of generations in our church, we all have a part to play. God is painting his story on a canvas of generations in the colors of the nations. Northern life, let's keep the canvas going. I think it's good to reflect that those um, little mini, the shorts of the core values are calls to action too for all of us to think, okay, what, there's a few questions in there that we're asked. So what are we doing about it tonight, tomorrow, in all the things we do? So there's a challenge there, I think, in our conversations and our connections with each other that we can take up. So I encourage you to do that. And I think the baptismal um, pool last Sunday is a good example of that canvas of colour, seeing people from backgrounds and ages and different experiences. It's just... Um, yeah, it's good to get the visual of that and, and be reminded of that and see the value of it, that for all of us. So, as I said, we're doing um, Canvas of Colour. In a minute, we're going to stand and recite the verse that we've um, selected for this month to learn. But I just wanted to say, first of all, have a look in the, we in the weekly email. There are a few dates coming up that we've um, put to give you some notice. So, there's a May Mission Month dinner on Saturday the 4th of May for the church family. There's Mother's Day, we're sort of working on that, but we want to do a uh, morning tea after the service in the morning and um, something else, hopefully, um, that morning to celebrate um, mums. And uh, we always say here, I think, that mums can um, be different sorts of things. They're not necessarily biological mums, so um, we like to celebrate that. And also coming up, this is a, um, a, a slower burn, but it gives you a chance to really get your performing um, dream <laughs> um, formulated to um, get up and join the Northern Life's Got Talent. It was such a good time last year. We just wanted to give people time to really think about what they're going to do and um, we can't wait for that. So have a think about that. Often things that are in the email, I feel like it's a, maybe it's a secondary or a third source. I'm too far away from academic learning these days to know. But it, it's derived a lot of the stuff from our website. So the website is an amazing place to have a look at lots of stuff. So have a look there. Um, there are some dates and things and um, events and lots of resources. So have a look there because um, everybody can access that whether you see the, the email or not. So let's stand together and have a look at um, Psalm 145, verses 8 to 13. Okay. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your <laughs> mighty acts and the glorious splendour of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Thank you. It's worth, have a seat, it's worth um, just seeking that, those few verses yourself and having a look at it and having a, a, a little bit more of a processing of it and have a think about how it connects to Canvas of Colour. Um, take a moment now to say hello to those next to you and if there's somebody new around you, especially take the time to say hello to them. Thank you. It's great to hear all the conversations, but let's continue them later and pray together. 
Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can gather here today in your presence. I pray that as we sit here surrounded by our family in Christ, that you will make your presence known to us in new and powerful ways. I thank you that you created us and love us. And I pray that as we learn more about what it means to be a canvas of colour, your family, that you will help us to see each other the way that you see us. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and to be able to be a light for your name in this world. I pray that you will be giving us your wisdom and your insight and that as we go out in our weeks that you would be guiding us and protecting us and helping us to live out your will for our lives. I pray for the rest of the service tonight that you will be making your presence known and that you will open our hearts to learn more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading tonight is from Mark 3, starting at verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Good evening. Is my mic on? Yeah, it is. So it's a little bit uh, different. I don't think many of us will do this many times in our lives where you, you uh, look at the, a gospel uh, at Easter and then the next week you're back straight into that um, earlier part of the gospel. But that's what we're doing because we're studying all the way through Mark. And um, as you heard this, the reading tonight, it's uh, back in Mark chapter 3. If you want to see the uh, teaching on the passage before this where Jesus uh, formally calls his disciples or his apprentices, that's this morning's message. So you could catch up on that if you want. I'm going to pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word just read to us, and we need your help to understand it. Um, As Abby has prayed, we appreciate your presence with us, and we ask that Jesus might be glorified in our digging into the word of God. I pray for help as I speak. Um, Lord, would you challenge, convict, and encourage us for Jesus. Amen. Every Monday night, we have uh, a couple of men, sometimes it might be 10 men, who come to uh, my house and in the garage. I'm looking around seeing some of the faces that are part of it. And we affectionately call this weight training session the House of Pain. So it's called Hop, and uh, it's been going for a couple of years. And we basically do some weights together. Now, there are some rules for Hop that you have to learn. Now, if you come and there's eight or ten guys in a small garage, you can't just do your normal workout. Because most people, they, they work out. They do, they do training. So it's like hard if people start grabbing weights from everywhere and they just go nuts. Um, so it's like the house rules are, and I normally have to say house rules are, we all do stuff 
in order. There's another rule that's a house rule, and it's about chalk. Because a lot of people don't use chalk at gyms, but they've watched videos on YouTube about people getting chalk and putting it there and just... <laughs> and making chalk go everywhere. And sometimes I have to just say, guys, house rules. I've got to vacuum up the floor. <laughs> don't need to do that. It's gentle. Just gentle. Just simple application. Another thing, another thing is... Big... <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> another thing which um, they hate me being a, 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 like a nanny, um, I always avoid putting heavy weights on the benches because it cuts the bench. And when you own the bench, you don't want it destroyed. So another house rule is when you're changing weights, don't put them on the bench, put them on the ground. We all grew up in a house with rules, amen? Yeah. We, all, <laughs> we all grew up in a house. House rules. It's not just at the house of pain. You grow up, grew up in a house. And in fact, I want to suggest tonight that not only is your family of origin a very important place where you learnt house rules, the house rules of your heritage, but the, the world itself is like a big house that has a whole lot of house rules and it's the kingdom of this world. And I think um, if you think about it, and it's what we see in this passage as well, that Jesus actually teaches us about the house of the kingdom of God. So there are three houses we're going to interact with tonight. The house of the kingdom in this world, the house of the kingdom of God and the house of my Heritage. So we're in Mark chapter 3. I just want to wander through it, make a few comments, and then come back to the ideas of the house. So chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus entered a house. Again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. It's jam-packed. We don't know where it is. It's probably Capernaum. He had a bit of a base there, and uh, it's probably there just before it seems like there's been ministry going on on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And we're told in verse 21, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. So his family's probably come from Nazareth, not that far away, and have come down over towards the Sea of Galilee. And they're thinking that, in the first century, he might be affected by the demonic. There might be something weird going on when they say he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, verse 22, um, who came down from Jerusalem, we know we've just studied what the teachers of the law did when they got together in the Sanhedrin and they decided to undermine Jesus and come up with false claims and ultimately get him killed. This, we've gone back in time in the story, and so this is where it all began. They heard that uh, there was uh, sort of a, a bit of a kerfuffle starting to be um, raised around this teacher named Jesus. And so they've come down from Jer Jerusalem. And they say he's possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. Now, they don't deny the fact that he has power over the uh, spiritual realm. And so they've called him... Um, that he's possessed by Beelzebul. If you try to look that up, it's a bit hard to exactly find out who Beelzebul is. But they, in the text, it tells us he's understood as the prince of demons. Clearly, the religious leaders are accusing Jesus basically of witchcraft, that he's being empowered by the, the dark side. So Jesus calls them over to him and begins to speak to them in parables. And he says, how can Satan drive out Satan? He says, so you say I'm on Satan's side, but you see what I'm doing. I am setting captives free from the power of the evil one. So how is that possible? And then he takes a moment to teach about house rules. If a kingdom is divided against itself, Jesus says, that kingdom can't stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, his end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. This is an allegory. But it's, I think, straight out of the uh, Proverbs of life wisdom, don't you think? A house divided will not stand. It doesn't matter where you find, like it's a, a business team, a sports team, a church... 
What Jesus is saying is true. A house divided will not stand, neither will the team of the demonic. And so he's making that point. Verse 28, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven for all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Now in the Christian worldview, where God by his mercy saves the world through his son Jesus sacrifice on the cross and resurrection from the dead that's the story of easter and to receive this salvation a person needs to believe to have faith that jesus is their savior if rather than believing that you actually believe that jesus christ who lived the perfect life died on a cross and rose again from the dead and requests invites us to put faith in him that he's the saviour, if you cho- choose to believe, unbelief, if I actually choose, you're not who you say you are, you're actually part of the demonic, then clearly I am not believing that he's the saviour of the world, right? I-, I personally don't think there's anything more to it than that. The unforgivable sin is to die believing that Jesus is not who he says he is. Then Jesus' mother, verse 31 Mother and brothers arrived, standing outside, they sent someone to call in to call him. A large crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus differentiates himself from his family of origin house rules. Mum, the matriarch, we don't hear anything about Jesus' dad at all, so we assume he's probably died. Uh, But mum, the matriarch, has come to take charge of her eldest son, who's gone a bit haywire, and Jesus lovingly differentiates. So what do we learn about house rules from this text? Firstly, the house of the kingdom of this world. House language might sound a little weird, but it's simply the idea that no matter what time in history you live, people live in houses and houses have rules, where we started. What are some of the uh, more interesting houses you've been in? This is an open question. You want to throw out an answer? What's an interesting house you've been in? Castles. Castles, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Any other interesting homes you might have slept over in or visited? We're very suburban, aren't we? (laughs) I was reflecting on this and I've been really blessed in my life. One of my favourite houses that I slept over the night in was uh, was in a bomber, which is a small um, area where Maasai warriors gather. And we slept over the night in a mud or cow poo hut a very small little hut that the chief, um, that was the chief's hut. And I remember there were certain rules about what you could do in that tiny little hut. And I haven't slept overnight in them all, but like I was thinking, I've been blessed by hospitality in slum homes in um, Guatemala and Ethiopia and Cambodia, Uganda, Zambia. And I can testify they all have rules. You come in and sometimes in Ethiopia you have to have a coffee, in other places you have to have goat milk and you sometimes you have to take your shoes off do you know, hear what i'm saying just house rules no matter where you go even in a cave don't you reckon if you visited some primitive people they'd be like we've got rules here is it just the way it works and there is an authority that the evil one has over this house over this world do you reckon that's true Where would you go if you were trying to prove it? If I said to you, the evil one has authority and there are house rules of the world, the world, the flesh, the devil, the world, where would you go to defend that, to prove that? Ephesians 6 is a spiritual battle we're in. Job, yeah, there's this interaction. I went straight to Ephesians 2, verse 1. As for you, this is before you are saved, 
Paul says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. I think there's a house, the house of the world, and it has rules. And it has someone who has authority, and it's the evil one. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. When Satan tricked Adam and Eve, think about it. Adam and Eve were given the stewardship mandate. They were meant to be just under God looking after the whole planet. But something like Esau and Jacob, there was a tricking that went on. There was a stealing of blessing and of stewardship. And there's this idea that the evil one now has authority. The world, as in the ideas which drive the culture of the world, are built on the foundation of a fallen humanity, which has at its core the lies of the evil one. What do you reckon? It's a statement. Is that a fair statement? So what happened in the garden has changed humanity and changed the world. The world always ultimately belongs to the Creator, our God, for sure. But the reign of sin and death is a reign of evil. Jesus has come to set captives free from that, from that house. Matthew 10 verse 8, Jesus says to his disciples, going out into this house of the world, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. In other words, set captives in the house of this world free. Luke 4, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he has sent me, Jesus says, God has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And so then we, this is what's leading us into this really important line. No one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up, then he can plunder the strong man's house. Do you think that Jesus might be referring to the house of this world, captives that are in the house that he wants to set free? Is it fair what I'm trying to establish? So how important is this idea of a strong man being bound up? Well, if you did the Revelation study last year, you might remember, for me, I sit in the camp, and there are different ways of understanding Revelation, but for me, I think what makes the most sense is that the millennium of 20, uh, Revelation 20 is a realised millennium. It's, we're in that millennium. It, it's an idea of the time between Jesus first coming to earth and him returning at the end. We're in the millennium. And so if you think about what that means with this chapter 20 of Revelation, John writes, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon. I think this is happening in the first century in the life of Jesus. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I think Satan has been bound. I think Jesus has done what he said needed to happen. The strong man needs to be tied up to plunder his house. That is, to rescue people who were caught in that, those chains of sin. And now you might say, but isn't Satan at work in the world? How would you... Well, can a mafia boss who's in jail do hits on people? I think, honestly, that's what's happening, that he is limited, but incredibly powerful. And if you read Revelation, that there's a letting go set free for a short time, that all makes sense with the Antichrist and all that language that we looked at last year. I think that this is actually literally what has happened, that there's a strong man in this house of the world and he has been tied up because of the stronger man's work. Amen? The stronger man's work, Jesus. Remember, John the Baptist said, one who's coming who is more powerful than me. And these are all um, demonstrations of this strength of Jesus. 
And he's sending people out with authority. So, again, this is opening up. Um, I want you to think about it, if you can. What are some of the house rules of the kingdom of this world? What are some of the house rules? We're not quite there yet. That's cool. I think, think about it. Some of the house rules. Be true to you, I think, is a house rule. Worship yourself. Not normally spoken exactly that, but I think that is the vibe of a house rule. Diversity is ultimate, not good, but ultimate. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying these are house rules that are coming through very strongly. Live your own truth. You do you. Subset underneath this is anger, greed, lust, power, selfishness as all part of the house rules of the world, played out, I would say, in each generation in slightly different iterations. Wouldn't you agree? It just looks slightly different, but it's normally the same. You know what's weird is child sacrifice is still there. It just happens in different ways, house rules. If you go with the flow and follow the house rules of this world... You can be heading in a direction that you don't want to be without knowing it. So in contrast to that, we have the house of the kingdom of God. Jesus taught so much about living a different way. Uh, House language. Is this a fair statement to make that there's a house? The kingdom of God is like a house. Old Testament is an easy argument. Psalm 27, one thing I have asked of the Lord that... Uh, will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord? It's very common language. It's everywhere. But the house of the Lord language, is it in the New Testament? Is it in the New Testament? Well, yeah, it is. First Peter 2.5, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. First Timothy 3, I hope to come to you soon, Paul writes, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, house rules. Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, I have sort of saw this, tried to aim for explaining this, and I feel like there is a good argument that the kingdom of God is talked about as a house. Matthew 7 is the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the great unfailing of how to live in the Jesus way. What's the metaphor, what's the story that the... the um, the allegory that he, that he ends up with, a house. This is all about building a house. It's either going to be on the rock, your house, or it's going to be on unstable ground. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house and it didn't fall because its foundation was on the rock. So think about it. What are some of the house rules that we know in the kingdom of God? I was talking about house rules in hop. Be careful with your chalk. Don't put your weights on the bench. Don't just grab weights and go crazy. Stick with the program. What are the house rules of the kingdom of God? I think worship God first. Love reigns. Grace is the fuel of life. We turn other cheeks in this house. Forgiveness and mercy is evident. Truth, light, and honesty is normal. What else would you say? How would you describe the house of the kingdom of God? What are the house rules? Yeah, loving God, loving others. Yeah, the greatest will be the servant. House rules of the kingdom. What are some of the other ones? Submission is part of it along those lines. Care for the weak. Forgiveness is a massive part of the house, isn't it? House rules. That we're meant to forgive others as we've been offered forgiveness, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, that we're meant to make disciples. What are the house rules? Like the way things, this is like true truth, this is the way things are. Because the kingdom of God, and that's the question you have to always think about, are the kingdom house rules the house rules 
Are they just ideas? What does the, the kingdom house rules say about sin? At what sin will do? Leads you to what? Death? Sin leads to death? Yeah, it separates from God. Does it lead to a happy life? It doesn't. It's a lie to think that I can find a better way to live than God's way. That's a lie. The house rules of the kingdom say God knows best. How did Jesus term it, his house rules, contrasting house rules to the house rules of the kingdom of the world? Didn't he say this? You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. Guys, this is the, this is the way of the kingdom. I want to tell you how it works. Kingdom of God language. So the third house that I think is in the text. So you've got the house of the kingdom of the world, house of the kingdom of God, and the house of my heritage right there. I find it fascinating, honestly, in this little vignette of the life of Jesus, in the midst of him teaching about the strong man being restrained. I mean, it's big stuff, isn't it? Satan is bound in the abyss. And, um, you know, we're rescuing people with the gospel. It's, it's big. And then mum's out the back. Mum's out the back saying, Jesus, get back here. No, I mean it now. Jesus. I could see Carl Barron doing a takeoff of it or something. Jesus, out now. And Jesus differentiates. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing that, even though his mum is literally treating him as a kid, I reckon. House of my heritage. Peter Scazzaro um, does fantastic work on this. He heads up the Emotionally Healthy Brand of Discipleship Training. And he says that line, which I find really great. As a Christian, we could say, Jesus lives in my heart, but who lives in my bones? Grandpa. Sorry, Dave. Grandpa lives in our bones. That means I have stuff from my family in me. The house of my heritage has rules. And a big part of discipleship is actually identifying what are they. Sometimes we can see what's going on in the house of the kingdom of the world, but we're unaware of what he calls the unholy Ten Commandments that you were given from your heritage. Now, this is not to bash our, our families. We appreciate our families. But I'm going to race through quickly. These are the ones that Pete Scazzaro puts up for his family. I believe Italian-American. He said, what, what I was taught for me in my house, house rules, was money. Money is the best source of security. The more you have, the more important you are. Make lots of it to prove you made it. That's what he grew up given as the rules of the house of the Scazzaro family. Conflict, he said, I learned that to avoid it at all costs, don't get, mad, don't get people mad at you. Loud, angry, constant fighting is normal, though. There were rules about sex. Sex is not to be spoken about openly. Men can be promiscuous. Women must be chaste. Sexuality in marriage will come easily. Rules that you often don't articulate but rules that he recognises he was given in his house. Grief and loss. Sadness is a sign of weakness. You're not allowed to be depressed. Get over losses quickly and move on. Expressing anger. Anger is dangerous and bad. Explode in anger to make a point. Sarcasm is an acceptable way to release anger. Unholy commandments. Family. You owe your parents for all they've done for you. Don't speak of your family's dirty laundry in public. Duty to family and culture comes before everything. Which is what the Jews believed. But what did Jesus do in that passage? It's very interesting what he does. Countercultural. Relationships. For Pete Scazzaro, his family, don't trust people, they will let you down. Nobody will ever hurt me again. Don't show vulnerability. Attitudes toward different cultures. Only be close friends with people who are like you. Don't marry a person of another race or culture. Certain cultures, races are not as good as mine. 
what he learned about success. Success is getting into the best schools, making lots of money, getting married and having children. Feeling and emotions. You're not allowed to have certain feelings. Your feelings are not important. Reacting with your feelings without thinking is okay. Do you get the picture? It's complex, isn't it? What we might be living under without even knowing it. These house rules. House rules of our heritage are often built around these three. Temptation one, I am what I do, performance. That's, I've just been taught that. I am what I have. Could have been part of your house rules. I am what others think, popularity. It's a big group here. I don't know if anyone's going to say anything, but I'll ask anyway. What are some of your house rules of your heritage? You can say things that are great and God-honouring, or you might say something that you've noticed has been something you want to change. Anything come to mind? Busyness is a sign of success. House rules of your heritage. Okay, did you hear that? You don't need God or religion. The universe will work in your favour if... If, if you let it, if you want it to, yeah. What are some of the house rules? Okay. Always have shiny shoes. Respect elders even if not warranted or earned or family comes first. Family comes first is a pretty common one, isn't it? Which again I think Jesus is challenging at least us to look at it and go, What do I do with that? House rules. Some of us in the room don't own our homes yet. But wherever you go, you take this set of rules, don't you? The type of person you are. But it's certainly once you, maybe you get married, maybe you have kids, it sort of feels certainly like there's, well, there's another generation coming. But um, no, I think that house rules flow on through people we disciple, people we hang out with, how we build community. A couple more, anything else that um, you feel prompted to share that might be helpful for others? House rules of your heritage, what, what were they? Okay. It's complex, the houses we come from, isn't it? Like, they really are. So you can see how the house of your heritage could be largely shaped by the house of the kingdom of God, couldn't it? Or it could be largely shaped by the house of the world. And so being able to reflect on that is really important. That's where I got to when I looked at this passage. I thought, what is, what is the main thing coming out of it for me? And I just sort of honed in on that idea that Jesus was demonstrating his authority over this house of the strong man. And he was saying, if you haven't noticed it yet, I am casting out demons one after the other. I'm setting captives free. 
I'm binding this strong man because I'm way stronger. And I'm going to teach. Mark doesn't show it as much as Matthew and Luke. Certainly John shows so much of Jesus' sort of inner circle teaching. But Jesus teaches how to live the life of the kingdom. There's a different bunch of rules. There's a different way of interacting with God and others. I love this passage in Colossians 1, just in verse 13. Paul writes, He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, putting that house of the kingdom of the world. If you've got faith in Christ, you have been rescued from one house and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, the kingdom of light, the house of the kingdom of God, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We're called to live under a new set of rules. Amen? We are. And um, just love hearing some of the band talk about in trying to put in practice Sabbath and put in practice you know, new house rules. It's wonderful. I'm just so glad to see that happening. I hope many of us are experimenting with how to get the kingdom rules into my house so that the, the difference isn't as much anymore. Um, let me finish with just this passage from Joshua 24 to the end of the book of Joshua now fear the Lord and serve him with faithfulness Joshua says to the people of Israel throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped throw out the house of your heritage that stuff is the house of the world there's a new kingdom to follow. Beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living, the gods of this world, the gods of your heritage. You make the choice, but as for me and my household we will serve the lord lord jesus we're praying and um, asking you for help we feel like we are marinated in the world in ways that we often don't even know are happening to us and um, we so appreciate community and your word and your spirit moving amongst a canvas of color would you help us as a faith community here become more and more a group of people that represent the house rules of the kingdom of God and live in such a way that others see your reality, the authenticity of our faith, that they might see a joy in the way that we live that points, that points all the glory back to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we're sorry where we've taken on the house rules of the kingdom of the world without knowing it. We've been uncritical. We've just taken it on board and then that's become our house. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy. It's new tonight. Thank you that you call sinners and you make us saints. You call the broken and the failed and you, you grant us freedom, forgiveness, and victory. Lord, would you, would you set captives free? Would you start tonight, take us on a journey towards the house of freedom that you have designed for us? Lord, I... I just remember the house rule that you said, if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And we look to you for freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you like to stand?
ark of faith in Christ, this steadfast hope shall not break apart within the trial. I am assured his promises will never fail. As long as life remains, he is faithful. God is patient. God is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. His ways are higher than my own. His thoughts consume the great unknown. Of this alone I am sure my God is love. Gone before us, 
finish tonight with some praise.
down the front next time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that your grace goes with us as we leave. And the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.